Welcome and good morning, Neighborhood Friends Church. We are so excited you are here for another amazing worship service online. I hope that you are jumping onto our YouTube channel and chatting with us and letting us know where you're coming from and what's happening on your Sunday mornings. We wanna hear from you. We wanna know what's happening and what is exciting in your home this morning. We have a great day planned, so don't miss out. We have worship with music and our worship team has grown just a little bit, which is exciting to have have our team starting to get back together. We have our NK, NK Kids worship um, service that's just made for them. Um, it's on the link. You just jump on and the kids can do the service on Sunday morning or they can do it all week long. We also have a time for giving and time to hear the word of God. So let's get started. us. Um, we're getting ready to just worship, to sing uh, to a good God. And before we sing, I want to just talk for a second about, uh, Donnie had been talking about the prayers of Paul and how um, he was just praying for joy and how excited he was. But all that time he was, most of those prayers he was doing in prison, in quarantine, in isolation. And he seemed to have this joy that was just overflowing and it's not crazy that Donnie's now talking about contagious joy because after seeing Paul have this contagious joy in and out of prison and through trials and trials and going, man, this is the greatest thing because it doesn't matter my circumstances. I am a child of God. And I am set free. I remember who I was and I know who I am now. So we're going to sing together, but we want to have that joy that even in our circumstances, I know who I am, that I am a child of God, and I have been set free. Amen? Would you guys sing with us?
forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say Father, as we continue to worship today, Father, I pray that <clears throat> while we're in our own little spaces, would you infiltrate into our hearts and our minds, that you could, would connect the journey from the head to the heart, Father, that you would align us with your Holy Spirit, Jesus, that you would allow us to open our hands in full surrender that we wouldn't hold on to the things of the past, we wouldn't hold on to the things of the present, or even our expectations for the future, but that we would hand it to you and replace that with who you are, replace that with your promises, and knowing that you are faithful and knowing that you are powerful and that you can overcome anything because your name is victorious. I know the night won't 
my goodness, wasn't that amazing? What an incredible time of worship. I just want to take a moment to, to say thank you to our worship team. They've been working really, really hard, Jake, and all the um, team that has been coming together. And now again, we've been adding some people. So it was absolutely amazing. I hope it was spirit filled and wonderful for you and your family. And we also want to tell um, Alex Kraft a Thank you. Thank you for all the hard work he's doing on the digital back end of everything that you're seeing comes from his hard work. So if you get a chance, also let him know, maybe in the chat line, thank you for all your hard work. Couple of things that you need to know. You need prayer. We have an excellent way of 
getting up online and letting us know your prayer requests. They're important to us. We pray as a church. We've had a lot come in this week, so that's pretty cool, but we want to keep those coming in. All you have to do is go to the link on the show notes right here on the YouTube channel, or you can find it on our link at neighborhoodfriends.org. Prayer room. We have an incredible prayer room that's going on on Friday nights. If you haven't had a chance to jump on, do it. It's amazing. We should be praying together as a church. That's where the power of God is ignited. It is a powerful time. If you need to know where you get the link for our prayer time, it is on the show notes and also on our webpage at neighborhoodfriends.org. You wanna know how to continue to give at Neighborhood Friends Church? There's three ways. Church Center app, text your tithe, or traditionally send it in. Just follow the app, it's below on the screen. And I just wanna take a moment to say thank you for your continued giving of our church. It's been a blessing. So now we're gonna take this time to jump into our morning message. You should be super excited. We're on week three of Contagious Joy out of Philippians. And so I would love for you to check out the sermon notes. They're below at YouTube, on the YouTube site, and also at neighborhoodfriends.org. Enjoy your Sunday and we can't wait to see you soon. Good morning, neighborhood friends. So glad that you joined me for another week in my backyard with a cup of coffee and Jesus. A little cheesy, I know. Week three, this series called Contagious Joy, we're looking at the book of Philippians, kind of walking through the book of Philippians during this quarantine. And you, you ask, why Philippians and why this walk through this book? because Paul wrote from a prison cell. He was under a serious quarantine, unlike ours. I said it last week, you can't compare Paul's prison cell to our quarantine. This is my prison cell, not that bad, right? I got a Traeger over there, I got steaks, I got food, I got everything that I need, right? I, I pray that you do too. Now, that doesn't minimize the fact that we're in a really weird time. People are in a major struggle and people are suffering. People actually are dying and, and whether you believe whatever numbers you wanna believe, the truth is there is a virus. The truth is people have lost their jobs. The truth is people are experiencing depression. It is a crazy time. So turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, 18 through 26, and I believe this is gonna be an encouraging passage for us today. And as you turn there to Philippians 1, starting with 18, I'm gonna ask you this question that I kind of finished up with last week as a launching point for today. How can the quarantine become our chains for Christ? 
and you're going, I, I don't get the question. What do you mean? How can you become our chains for Christ? Well, in verse 13 of chapter one, Paul says this, for everyone in this prison cell, the entire palace guard, they know why I'm here. They know that I am in chains because of Christ, because of Christ. I mean, he's like putting it on Christ. But let me, let me put it this way. Maybe we could phrase it this way because I think this would even make more sense. Everybody then knew why Paul was in prison, that he was in, he was in prison for Christ, for him, not for Caesar, not for the, the Roman government, not for anything else, not for preaching news that the government didn't want him to preach, but because of Jesus. Paul knew that he was in prison for a purpose, not in prison for punishment. There's a sermon in there, prison for purpose rather than a prison for punishment. We are not under quarantine for punishment. We're in quarantine for a purpose. And what's our biggest purpose right now in a lot of people's lives is fear and doubt and worry and concerns and hardships. And Paul takes this crescendo of pain that he's in and he says, you know what? I'm going to build from here. I'm going to grow from here. And I want us to look at it the way that Paul's looking at it. Because in this pandemic, what's contagious is all our frustrations. But what's more contagious in the middle of a frustration is when somebody has unmerited joy. Unmerited. Like you look at it and go, there's no reason for you to be happy. Why are you happy? Because the joy of Christ is in me. So let's begin in Philippians chapter 1, 18 through 26. It says this, but that doesn't matter. So he's saying, it doesn't matter what's going on, really. It doesn't matter who's using this to preach whatever gospel they want to preach to benefit for themselves. He's saying, whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am totally convinced that I will remain alive so I I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Father, we come to you. We thank you for these scriptures. May they become our own. May we look at this time the way that Paul looked at the time when he was in prison as just an opportunity for the gospel to flourish, go out, and do its work. Help us, Father, to see the work that you are doing already. Help us to join in on that work and help us as neighborhood friends to become a beacon of hope to our neighborhood so that people will never doubt that they are alone, that they are in isolation, that they live in depression without hope, that they're frustrated without, uh, without faith, that you are here to give them the joy that they deserve, that they need, and that we all want, Lord. We thank you today, and may your kingdom come right now in this time, and may your name always be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So the message title is called Doorways and Dead Ends. Have you ever opened that doorway that you thought for, I mean, you were for sure, it was going to lead to something unbelievable. Maybe it was that education that you worked so hard for that you thought it was going to give you the career you wanted. How many people have have a degree in something they're not even using, right? It just kind of turned to a dead end. How about, how about people in life who have sought after that perfect relationship, and it just seems like it's absolutely perfect. Match.com matched you up 100%. And it just didn't pan out. It turned into a dead end. You see, we're constantly trying to open new doors that will end in something that will cause us to have some sense of everlasting joy. And there's only one place for that. 
I want to tell you a story about a guy by the name of Steve Jobs. I don't know if you know about Steve Jobs, but see this little thing right here, and then I got one here, and I got one right there. There are three pieces of equipment that uh, Steve Jobs was kind of the brainiac that founded these things. So just right here alone, I probably got about $3,000 worth of gear that went into Steve Jobs' pocket. Not totally, but... In his biography, this guy, Walter Isaacson, wrote a biography about Steve Jobs, and he told this story about Mr. McIntosh uh, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation that he had with him in his backyard. And this is how it went, and this is in his biography. I remember sitting in his backyard in his garden one day, and he started talking about God, meaning Jobs. He said, sometimes I believe in God, sometimes I don't. I think it's 50-50 maybe. But ever since I've had cancer, I've been thinking about it more and I find myself believing a bit more. Maybe it's that I want to believe in an afterlife that when you die, it doesn't just all disappear. The wisdom you've accumulated, somehow it lives on. And then he paused for a second and he said, yeah, but sometimes I think it's just an on and off switch. You click it and you're gone. And then he paused again and he said, and that's why I don't like putting on-off switches on Apple devices. Joy to the world. There is an afterlife. You see, Steve Jobs' trial with cancer became a deeper pursuit in his doorway to joy. Now, I don't know what his faith was like at the end of his life, but there's a lot of dialogue just in those phrases right there that would make him begin to see that possibly there is more in the life to come. There's more than just developing an iPad or a MacBook or an iPhone. There's more than opening a doorway that leads to a life now. There's a doorway that opens up to a life of eternal. And if we have an eternal perspective on our physical life, it makes our physical life actually more bearable during trials. So here's the big idea for today. Trials either become doorways or dead ends in our pursuit of joy. They just do. Trials will either become a dead end for you, a dead end in frustration, fear, anger, and just complete irritation, or they'll become a pursuit of joy. The reality of life and death uh, puts us in a place, especially the reality of life and death during trials, makes us think about what really matters in life. It puts us in a position to actually do an inventory of what's most important. Culture usually avoids conversations about life and death. In fact, uh, as of recently, I think some of you know that I've been uh, working as a chaplain on the side for a uh, hospice healthcare agency called Agape Hospice. And every time I tell somebody, they're like, so you're doing what? Oh, I'm a chaplain. I do it on a few nights, a couple nights, and, and, and some weekends. What do you do? I'm, well, I'm a hospice chaplain. Oh, bless your heart. That's terrible. I would hate to do that. I'd hate to do that. And when I hear that, when I hear those statements, I always go, no, I, it's the greatest opportunity ever for me to share the gospel with somebody in their toughest time of life. It's a critical point in their life. Trials are when we are most receptive to the conversations about life and death. And so right now, in this time, we're experiencing a ton, we're experiencing a ton of death and grief and fear and loss. It's everywhere we go, not just with COVID, but the effects of quarantine are causing people to live in depression. We're seeing suicide rates go up. Physical uh, abuse is going up. Self-inflicted abuse is going up. And Paul, literally in this moment, where he's fearing for his life, he stares it straight in the face and he doesn't even flinch. In fact, it's almost like he has this appetite for trial. In fact, 2 Corinthians 11 uh, verses 22 through 33, I'm not going to read them all, but I want you to hear what Paul actually describes as kind of his afflictions for the gospel, the things that he had to suffer in order for the gospel to go out. He says, I've suffered in, in labors more abundant, in stripes more me, uh, 
above measure in prisons more frequently, faced death often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, not that kind. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of wilderness, in perils of the sea. In per- you see what I'm saying? I think you get the point. And it just goes on. I get anxiety just reading this. It's crazy. But in verse 13, he says, I am literally in chains for Christ. This is the very reason I'm going through this trial is so that the gospel will go out. He knows a thing or two about trials. Take it from Paul. He knows a thing or two about trials. It's kind of like that farmer's insurance jingle where he says, he is Paul. Bum, ba dum bum, 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 bum. The whole marketing campaign of Farmers Insurance is brilliant because they just, they just literally are saying that we know a thing about your trials. We know a thing or two about all the things you've suffered and gone through. We've seen them all. There's not anything we haven't seen. Well, Paul's letting these things out to show us that there is kind of a spiritual life insurance when you follow Jesus. He is our agent for real life. And he's going to take care of you no matter what you face. The big idea is simply this. Trials become our doorways or dead ends in our pursuit of joy. I want to remind you of that over and over. True joy is not determined by circumstances. True joy is determined by a resilient, strong, growing faith filled with joy. Verse 18, he says this. I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. He said, none of that matters. I rejoice, and I'm going to continue to rejoice. In verse 19, he goes on and he says, I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. This is actually a really good word for us today. Not because I think you're going to, you're at a a precipice of life and death. But let, let me just ask you this. Do you know what tomorrow brings? None of us do. We spend all kinds of energy trying to control things that we're never meant to be controlling and or ever asked to control. So here's the encouragement that I want to give you today. You get to choose. You get to choose to live and bring honor to Jesus today. You get to choose whether you will bring honor to Jesus today. No matter what your day brings, no matter what tomorrow brings, no matter what your past tells you, no matter what your insecurity is actually screaming in your life, no matter what you face, it's your position today to choose whether or not you will live for the glory of Christ even in your trial. It's not a dead end. It's a doorway to bring God's glory. Verse 19, he says this. He said, this will lead to my deliverance. And I love this word deliverance because I think at first take when you read this, you think he's talking simply about getting out of prison. But the word that he uses here is not the same word that we think it is of being freed. It's deliverance meaning salvation. It's an ultimate deliverance. In fact, Grant Osborne, who wrote a commentary on the book of Philippians, says this, Nero's decision in Paul's legal case at this time is going to be announced soon. He did not know whether his deliverance would be temporary, enabling a trip back to to the, the Philippians, or eternal, constituting his trip to his true home in heaven. In fact, he, he follows up with this and he says, God's, not Caesar's decision, was to be announced any day. God's decision was going to be announced. It wasn't up to Caesar. It was up to God that whatever Caesar chose, whatever Caesar would choose, God was going to use, right? Paul knows that the ultimate deliverance in his life was not necessarily physical. His ultimate deliverance is always eternal. And you say, well, Pastor D, how do you know that? Because verse 20 says it. Verse 20 gives us a little clue at the very end of it. He says, I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. One of my favorite preachers is a guy by the name of Tony Evans. I've, I've listened to Tony Evans for years. And um, just recently, over the past few months, 
his wife had passed away and lost her battle with cancer. And uh, they went through quite a time over the last year where they, they believed she was going to have full healing. They were praying for that. And I watched a little bit of the funeral, and his son, Jonathan Evans, spoke about his mom. But he spoke about his own frustration of, about how he wrestled with God and he prayed to God and asked God to heal his mom. And he felt like in that moment, like God didn't listen and God didn't answer his prayers. And he said God replied to him. He felt like God literally, literally in, in a way, audibly replied to him in this way. Just because I didn't answer your prayer, Jonathan, your way, doesn't mean I didn't answer, answer your prayer anyway. Because of the victory I've given you, there is always two answers to your prayers. Either she is going to be healed or she is going to be healed. Either she was going to live or she was going to live. Either she was going to be taken care of or she was going to be well taken care of. And I love that because whether or not we believe God answers our prayers anyway, he doesn't mean that he doesn't answer our prayers any way. He always answers our prayers, just maybe not always the way that we hoped for, but he's always going to use the outcomes to bring him glory, and he's going to take us along for the ride, and we are going to be enlightened and filled with joy in the process. In God's economy, victory belongs to the Lord, not to us. That's true in life and death, but it's also true in our physical life and our eternal life. We can become so scared, listen, we can become so scared of death that we forget how to live. Like people are doing this right now. We are so scared that we're going to get sick that we forget how to live. We can become so filled with fear that we forget how to live. And it's the living that makes us healthy. True story, the living makes us healthy. If you are living in fear, you are more apt to get sick. I don't know if you know this, but studies prove, and I have no numbers to prove that to you today. I wish I would have just thrown that out there. But Paul had no fear because he knew that his deliverance was salvation, and ultimately his victory would be in the hands of his heavenly father. And he's a son. So Paul presents this hypothetical dilemma uh, in, in the next few verses in 21 through 24. Now listen to this. He says, for me... Living means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. Isn't that crazy? And he says, I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Think about the situation. It's a hypothetical question that he kind of presents here. It's like he's having a conversation with God in a way, and he's kind of saying, would I rather go and be, die and be with you, Lord? Or would I rather just live and do ministry for you, Lord? Let me say it again. Would I rather die and go be with you, Lord, or would I rather live and be with you, Lord, and do ministry for you, Lord? And the answer is yes both and to live as Christ what a way to live I mean honestly what a resilient faith what an existence to remember where he was in his chains with a beefcake of a Roman soldier tied up next to him and he has this translation where he basically says my life is not defined by my context my life is con is defined by my king my king who's risen undefeated can't ever be defeated I'm on his team whether I'm with him that's good news for me or whether I stay and live I will do ministry Many fear all kinds of things. I used to fear a lot of things as a kid. The dark, bugs, snakes, rats, heights, roller coasters, deep water, spiders, my mother's wrath. I could handle my dad's, but not when my mom really got angry. And maybe even uh, my grandmother at night when she had no teeth. That one is absolutely true. Scared the daylights out of me. 
Paul has a reason to not fear anything, not even his grandma's like false teeth out of her mouth late at night. Life and death always is a, door, a doorway, not a dead end. Let me say it again. Life and death is always a doorway, not a dead end. It's always an opportunity. John Chrysostom was the Archbishop, Archbishop of Constantinople. I didn't even know that place existed until I read this, but he was a theologian and a politician and a really, really powerful man in his day. And he was at a point in his life where he was uh, basically being persecuted by the Byzantine Empress and was being banished from his political power position and threatened with death. So he was put into prison, stripped of his possessions and put into isolation. And he has this amazing response and I wanna read it to you. So good, so powerful. He said, when driven from the city, I cared nothing for it. But I said to myself, if the empress wishes to banish me, let her banish me. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If she would saw me, sunder, saw me in sunder, let, me, let her saw me in sunder. I have Isaiah as a pattern. For she would plunge me into the sea. I remember Jonah. If she would thrust me into the fiery furnace, I see three children enduring that. If she would cast me into to the wild beasts, I call my mind to Daniel in the, in the den of lions. If she would stone me, let her stone me. I have before me Stephen, the, uh, the pro-martyr, the, the proto-martyr, if she would take my head from me, let her take it, I have John the Baptist. If she would deprive me of my worldly goods, let her do it. Naked came I from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. Paul reminds me that if I still work, still work to please men, I would cease to please the Lord. What an incredible confidence in his faith. What can you do, honestly, with a Christian like Paul or John Chrysostom? What, what do you do with somebody who believes like that, has that type of faith? There's nothing you can do to hurt them. They have a new life in Christ, and if you do things like take their possessions, it's okay, you're satisfied. My wealth is in Christ, it is in the riches of heaven. If you isolate me, that's okay, I'm not simply alone. I'm actually with him in all the heavenly hosts. I'm with the angels. If you, if you strip me of my clothes, I'm clothed in Christ. You can't change me. You can't destroy me. It's like, it's like trying to blow, uh, blow onto a fire and realizing all you're doing is stoking its flame and its strength. You can't blow out a strong fire with your, with, with your breath. You just stoke its strength and its power. The question that I have for you, how does this apply to you? But a deeper question is how doesn't it apply to you? You don't have to fear. We don't have to fear. Whatever comes, Christ will sustain us. Now, this might be a little over the top, but I'm going to say it anyway. Do you know what tomorrow brings? Do you know whether or not you're actually going to live or die? Nobody has that, insert that certainty. Nobody can make the claim that says, Tomorrow, I am confident that I will be here. In fact, James's half-brother talks about this. He says, how do you know what your life will be like, if, like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It's here for a little while, and then it's gone. It's like, it's like Steve Jobs saying, that's why I don't like putting switches on Apple devices. Because sometimes I think God's like that. He's just a switch we turn on and off. And he realized that he's not. Our life is like a morning fog. It's like a vapor. It's here in one moment and it's gone the next. Today, it's COVID. My question is, tomorrow, what is, what's it going to be? Because if it's not COVID, it'll be something else. What's it going to be in two months? What's it going to be in six months? What's it going to be in two years? What we do know now is that the gospel will always carry our greatest purpose during our trials. We have no fear, no reason to fear. No reason to be scared of the days tomorrow because he's with us now and he's going to strengthen us in the moment and we have confidence he's going to do it in the days ahead. Philippians 1.25, he says, I'm convinced and I will remain 
alive and I'm convinced that I will remain alive so that I can t- continue to do this. And this is where it turns the corner so that I can help all of you grow in your experience of joy and faith. What Paul's saying is, I embrace the mission of God regardless of what I face. Even in this state, God is at work and I'm going to be in it and I'm going to be on it. I'm going to move in it and I'm going to be with it and I'm going to go forward. When I first started walking with the Lord and started to really try to understand his presence, I started asking questions like, God, I thought this relationship with you was going to keep me away from all my trials. Don't you have some way of really protecting me? I think that's often the, the, the question for our Christian faith is we come to Jesus knowing that, thinking that he's just going to fix everything. But there's still viruses. There's still brokenness. There's still divorce. There's still depression. There's still physical abuse. There's still children not being fed. There's still sickness and death and dying. The question, the the answer to that question is simply this. If you and I are not subject to the sufferings that we face in this life, we can't ever be a voice of hope to the people who are suffering in this life. (laughs) When we weep, we weep for a purpose because God's going to bring us people that will weep that same story. When we have fear, we can speak hope into people who are fearing. When we have doubt, we get to be the answer to people's questions. He has graciously called us to participate in this gospel and this good news of hope. And to do it, we have to abide and walk with him. This is truth one. Take home truth one. And it's out of verse 22. Life is fruitful work. It's not just trying to survive. It's fruitful and it's work. It's both and. He says, but if I live, I'll do more fruitful work for Christ. This is why I try desperately to stay healthy because I know that if I can be healthy and if my heart is healthy, my physical body's strong, literally, I do this because I want to live long days so that I can share the gospel with people who need it most. So I I thought a bit about this, about fruit itself. How How do you get fruit? How do we get fruit? Literally fruit, apples, bananas, and oranges. You're like, I go buy them. No, you don't get fruit by buying them. You get their possession by purchasing them. There's a sacrifice and that's money, right? But you get fruit because somebody planted it. You get fruit because somebody watered that plant. You get fruit because somebody prayed for a harvest, even through the storms. Someone worked hard to put that fruit into a grocery store so that you would sacrifice a little bit of cash to actually have it. Somebody worked for it and sacrificed for it. To live is Christ, to die is gain. This is the tension that we have to live in with our faith. And we work in this tension. We live in this tension for the glory of Christ. You see, if our Christian faith was easy, I wouldn't have a job. I wouldn't have to preach it. But see, I preach it because our Christian faith is difficult to understand sometimes, especially in days like this. But I'm here to tell you to keep the faith, keep going, keep moving on. Pete Gregg wrote in his book, How to Pray, he says, delight without discipline eventually inevitably dissipates. It runs out of steam. But when delight and discipline learn to dance, the relationships thrive. Number two, life is best lived for the joy of others. So number one, Life is fruitful work, but life is best lived for the joy of others. When he says, for your sakes, it's better that I live. It's better that I live. For you, it's better that I live. It's like the good things that we give people. It's better that I live so that I can give the goodness of God to people. It's like, it's better that I live so I can give you pizza. Everybody loves pizza or a good steak, or a vacation, or sleep. If I could give you pizza, or a vacation, or a good night's sleep, I could give you something that would be the goodness of God, really, truly. But I I have the opportunity to give you the gospel of Jesus Christ. For your joy, it's better that I live if I proclaim Christ in everything that I do. I want what drives Paul to drive me and you. He's not driven by self-preservation. He's not driven by something 
that benefits himself. He's driven by love and for the joy of you. That's why I'm here. So where'd it come from? Where'd that joy for the gospel come from? Jesus, the most sacrificial man in human history. There's none other that he would deny himself, take up his cross so that we wouldn't have to even really have to take up our cross. That he would die so we don't have to die. That he would rise from the grave so that we can have victory over anything in life. And he did that, not for the love of himself, but the, for the love of you and I. Number three is this. Life is best lived with a mindset to help others grow in joy. That we would be convinced that we would remain alive in this day and in this time. That we believe God's going to protect us during quarantine so that we can continue to help people experience the joy of their faith. The joy of growing. I love how he puts those in the same phrase, joy and growing, growing, because they're the two main themes of the entire book of Philippians, but you can't have joy without growth. Like an easy way to illustrate this is just watch a child who learns how to take a couple steps. When they begin to walk, they're growing, but the joy on their face is like fear and elation all at the same time, and they are growing and they're getting older, and they're stepping into their existence and their future. It produces joy on our face and their face, and everybody around. You see, here's the point I want to make to you today. Take, home, take this one home for sure. Joy is not waiting for you in the next room when COVID's over. Joy is not in that next room. Joy, right now, is the door to the next room. It's the door to the next room. Joy is our strength. Joy is our hope. Joy is our foundation. And that's why he says, take pride in Christ Jesus for what he is doing in your life. Take pride that you're in the one who wins. Take pride because you're in the one who, you're with the one who knows what he's doing and he is at work. Amen. We have a reason to rejoice. That's all there is to it. We have a reason to celebrate. We have a reason to believe that our trials are not just doorways to dead ends, but they're doorways in our pursuit of joy. To live is Christ, to die is gain. May the love of Jesus actually walk with you today. If you don't know Christ, it's really simple. That you're just saying, God, I, I no longer trust in my past, my brokenness, my fears, my doubts. I no longer want to trust in what the news tells me or anything this world gives me. I want to only trust in you. I trust in your cross. I trust that your blood is enough to cover my sins and that my future is found in the, the, the sure foundation of your salvation. My deliverance ultimately is in your protection, your leading, and your cross, and your blood for my life. Thank you. I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter, and I want to follow you. It's simple. It's simple. It's just saying, I surrender to your plans. I trust you. Father, we praise you and thank you today. I pray for this church. Pray for our future. May you guide us and direct us. And in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, join us right now, right now, in our lobby on the Zoom call, okay? Jump on there. The link is down below, right down there. Press that link. We'll see you in a minute. Have an awesome week. Love you guys.
Yeah.